Forty years ago this year, a film adaptation of a children's novel was made. A children's film that many said no child should ever be permitted to see. A friend of mine relayed a lesson from his ecology class, which was that rabbits are the Snickers bars of the wild. So many things regularly prey on rabbits, it is downright shocking. So the life of a rabbit is not an easy one. And this film pulls no punches. When one thinks of cute anthropomorphized critters in animation, whether it's little hats and waistcoats acting like people, or just animals who act like people in general, the idea of it being a horrifying view of a life where death is on every side, well, shocked a number of angry parents. And yet, Richard Adams, writer of the novel that this was based upon, believed that it was necessary to have scare in his stories, to not varnish over the facts, but expose children to the harsh realities, even within fiction. The story was a spontaneous result of a plea by his girls for a story on long car trips to school at Stratford-upon-Avon. So he began a tale of two rabbits named Hazel and Fiverr, but couched in his own experiences. He had read a book by Ronald Lockley called The Private Life of the Rabbit, and used that to provide the foundation for his story, to tell of life from the point of view of these two rabbits. Yet The Private Life of the Rabbit was a naturalistic book, and so this was a tale that was couched in reality. No little waistcoats are acting like human beings in animal skins here. They were animals that were concerned with the basic animal needs of survival, short and long term. And yet, Adams was an educated man, so he couldn't help but draw upon his own experiences in the rich world of literature to apply human ideas to the world of these rabbits. Not to change how they behaved, but to instead apply a layer over the top of them that lent the whole endeavor to allegories of human experience. Unintended by Adams, but visible like a Rorschach test to those who read the work. For some, it was about the founding of the modern state of Israel. For others, it was about the emancipation of slaves. For still others, it was about the aftermath of the Rwanda genocide, and so on. In telling a tale of rabbits, Adams had unwittingly crafted a tale that was very, very human. Adams, however, wasn't looking for any kind of allegory. He was simply telling a story to his daughters, and he drew upon whatever inspiration struck him. He had been in the 250 Company of the 1st Airborne Division during World War II, and his experience with the company helped inspire the composition of his drove of rabbits. Hazel, for instance, was inspired by the commanding officer, Major John Gifford. Everything about him was quiet, crisp, and unassuming. He was the most unassuming man I have ever known. When giving any of his officers an order, he usually said, Please, would you like to? Or, perhaps you'd better. He could be extraordinarily cutting. At least one sensed it like that because a rebuke from him was so quiet and rare, and because everyone had such a high regard for him that you felt his slightest reproof very keenly. Another of particular note was the big and brave rabbit Bigwig, who was based upon Captain Paddy Cavanaugh. He was an Irish journalist turned soldier who jumped from planes hauling all manner of heavy equipment just to prove that it could be done and passed the time by tossing a live hand grenade back and forth with one of his friends. Even the rabbit's bird friend, Kihar, was inspired by a Norwegian resistance fighter. It was no surprise, then, that a significant aspect of the book wasn't just survival, but resistance to cruel tyranny. But it wasn't all just the war, either. The setting was near where Adams had grown up, in Berkshire. While there, his father was a family doctor, and so knowing the girls would be aware of this, had their grandfather appear in this story when a girl recovered Hazel and brought him to be looked over by the doc. Well, the girls enjoyed the story immensely and told him that he had to write it down. It was far too good to waste. Adams was working full-time as a civil servant there and so was resistant to the idea of investing so much time in such an endeavor. But they persisted, and so to again make his daughters happy, he sat down to write the book. There are two different accounts, one saying that Adams had never written any book before this, but he himself said a few years before his death that he had written one work before that. But this discrepancy could be explained as perhaps some non-fiction piece likely related to his work. He didn't really elaborate on it, though, so that's just speculation. But either way, it was a new experience, putting it down in his spare time over the course of 18 months 
until he finally had completed it. Hazel and Fiverr. And no one was interested. He went to six or seven publishers. There's some disagreement on this. And the reason for its rejection was always the same. You can't get older children to read it because it's about rabbits, so they'll think it's too childish. And you can't get younger children to enjoy it because it's written in an adult style. And to top it off, Fiverr has precognitive abilities, adding a strange contrast to the otherwise naturalistic setting of the tale. They simply couldn't identify the target age market for the book, and Adams said he'd never written it with an age group in mind. It was never meant to be a this book or a that book. It was meant to simply be a book, one that anyone could read and enjoy. In the end, Adams finally self-published a few copies for himself and his friends, fearing that would be the only way the book would ever see the light of day. Finally, Rex Collings, an independent publisher, decided to give the book a go, settling for a 2,000 to 2,500 copy print run. The precise figure varies. He couldn't even afford to give an advance to Adam. He was a small-time operation, with his usual material being children's books or works from Africa. His family had old connections to the continent, and it fascinated him, so he regularly published the works of black and white African authors, including greats like Wol Soyinka, who would go on to be the first African to win the Nobel Prize. And Collings made connections with a publisher in Cape Town to publish books that had been banned in South Africa. In addition to his outreach efforts to both Africa and the Middle East, Collings was an avid naturalist himself. So in light of both the nature of this tale and the aforementioned Rorschach test that was the unintended allegory, he decided to take a chance on this extremely risky venture, and he knew that it was. He said to his friend Isabel Quigley, I'd just taken on a novel about rabbits, one of them with extrasensory perception. Do you think I'm mad? But as Quigley said, Collings was a person who believed in doing the right thing, even if it meant he was going to lose money. But while the book was a risk, Collings was by no means a fool. He had experience at the larger publishers before starting his own one-man publishing operation, and so he ensured that copies of those books got into the right hands, reviewers whose opinions held sway and would help get the word out in their magazines and newspapers. And it worked. Watership Down, as it was retitled by Collings after the main location of the book, received glowing reviews. The book sold out, and Penguin published the book through its Puffin line of children's books. Soon, Watership Down won a Carnegie Medal for its outstanding contribution to children's literature. But as Adams had said, Watership Down wasn't created for children. It was written to be for everyone. And so it should be no surprise that it left a huge impression on one particular fan, Martin Rosen. When Rosen read it, he'd been working at a literary agency surrounded by people who created for a living, and so he decided that he was going to take the plunge that he thought about for a long time but had never felt right, creating something himself, and he wanted that something to be watership down. Of course, adapting such a tale would be a tremendous challenge. Live-action cinema was out of the question, obviously. This is a very violent book, and even if one could get the animals to perform with human voiceover, it would be counter to the values of everyone involved to subject animals to such situations deliberately. Opera and ballet were briefly considered, but adapting it that way just didn't seem like it would work. So it left only one avenue open for Rosen, animation. Never mind that he knew nothing about animation at all. He was determined to learn what he needed to know to adapt Watership Down to an animated film. It was an uphill battle for him, having to learn the trade, having to get the rights to the work, and having to somehow find someone willing to finance such an unlikely production. Fortunately, Rosen's connections through his literary career helped place him exactly in the right place at the right time. While at a party being thrown by one of his director friends, he managed to strike up a conversation with Baron Oliver Poole. Poole politely asked what Rosen was doing, and the man explained, with typical passion, what he wanted to do with Watership Down. And after hearing all that he had to say, Poole made two revelations. One, he owned 80% of Lazard Brothers & Company, a major mercantile bank, and when a bank of their pedigree backs something, other banks are comfortable with joining in. And two, the reason he had that share was because of Pearson PLC, 
which at the start of the decade had purchased Penguin, the one that printed the later edition of that book, remember? So thanks to Lord Poole, the project was now a go. But of course, there was still the matter of not knowing anything. So Rosen brought in John Hubley, who brought an experience going all the way back to his work on Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the film which happened to also be the first full-length cell animated movie in history. He provided a lot of solid footing for the production while Rosen was still learning where you buy tables and desks for animators. Hubley would direct the opening mythological portion of the film, done in a different style to emphasize its more fantastical aspects. But for the majority of the film, the effort was made to go realistic whenever practical. Adam's tale was based upon real places, after all, and so visits were set up to the countryside around Watership Down, where photos and sketches and even helicopter shots on film were employed to get the details of the place down. And actual animals were carefully studied to find how to animate them so that, while they had expressions that could be readable to a human audience, they would nevertheless look like their natural behavior. But things ran into trouble when tragedy struck. Hubley passed away during heart surgery, and Rosen discovered that, in addition to everything else he was learning, he had to add how to direct a movie to the list. But he was determined to see it through. Rosen took up the mantle and pressed on. Given the popularity of the book, especially in the UK, it was easy to get real talent to sign up for the project, like John Hurt and Nigel Hawthorne, and even Zero Mostel of the producers, despite objections from Equity. And for the music, the great Malcolm Williamson was tapped. Rosen contacted him nine months ahead to ensure that there would be plenty of time. So he was shocked when he was called the night before the recording by Williamson's agent, saying that not only would Williamson be unable to come, he had only completed the music for the introduction. How, it was asked, had this happened? Well, Sir Malcolm was so respected because he was master of the Queen's music. And this happened to be the year of the Queen's Silver Jubilee, so a great deal of special music was required. According to reports, the Queen was very displeased. Apparently the pressure must have gotten to him, and he descended into alcoholism. In fact, he never did complete the Jubilee Symphony. So it's no surprise, then, that he was unable to complete the musical score for an animated film about rabbits if he couldn't compose a symphony for the Queen herself. Rosen was horrified and had no idea how they were going to get out of this one. Well, it so happened that his editor, Terry Rawlings, was at the start of his career as an editor and would go on to edit films such as Blade Runner, Chariots of Fire, and Alien. Well, before all of that, he worked in the sound department, and he said, I know just the person. She's a genius. Her name was Angela Morley. And it was explained to her what had happened, that all Williamson had done was sketched out the first six minutes. So together with Larry Ashmore, whom she invited to the meeting to discuss how to resolve this, the two managed to turn the six-minute sketch into the opening of the film in time for the orchestra to perform it. Rosen was so impressed with her that he couldn't figure out the conundrum. Why was this hugely talented composer such a complete unknown? With her familiarity with all aspects and her undeniable skill, how could she simultaneously be an expert and a nobody? It was finally explained that to find her history, you didn't look under the name Angela Morley. You looked under Wally Stott. Morley was transgender and after reassignment had begun working under her new name. Well, with a firm grasp of her solid reputation to back things up, Rosen was convinced that he needed her to finish the job, and practically pleaded with her to do it. Time was short, and Morley wasn't sure that she could pull that off, especially because she had never actually read the book. But they showed her the film and spoke passionately about it, and took her out to dinner to plead their case, and finally, she relented and agreed to do it. She created most of the music within a two-week period, impressing Rosen to no end. The only truly famous part of the film's music that she didn't do was the song Bright Eyes, which was written by Mike Batt and was sung by Art Garfunkel. Now, Art Garfunkel didn't like the song at all, and so he refused to have it included on the release of his solo album, Fate for Breakfast. Well, funny story. 
The album was a bomb. Not one top 40 single. The album didn't get above 67 on the U.S. chart, and it got negative reviews from industry magazines left and right. Meanwhile, Bright Eyes was topping the chart around the globe, so when it came time to release Fate for Breakfast in the U.K. and around Europe, they stuck Bright Eyes on there just to try to salvage the album. And it worked. Speaking of albums, despite her superhuman effort to try to get the job done, Angela Morley was stunned to learn that none of the music that she or Williamson had done was going to appear on the film's soundtrack album. She wondered what the hell they were even going to put on it then. So the company said it was going to be Bright Eyes and then 57 minutes of songs inspired by the film. She was heartbroken. So when Rosen learned what had happened to the woman who had delivered for them, he approached her personally to assure her that this was not going to happen. It had been written into her contract specifically to avoid someone trying this shenanigan. So not only was it on the album, but her song, Kiar's Theme, was on the B-side of the single for Bright Eyes. The film would go on to be a hit, although there was some controversy around the violence, which, as I said at the beginning, made some parents believe that it should never have been seen by children. Rosen had tried to make that point clear, with the poster showing a scene of a rabbit being choked by a snare, and announcing that the enemies of rabbits will kill them if they catch them. But the subject matter, combined with being animated, had led to the mistaken rating that this should be rated for young audiences. Hence the backlash. But how was the movie itself? Let's take a look at Watership Down. <laughs> 